Welcome, everybody, to Season 1, Episode 19 of Taking It to the Nub. I'm your host, Boston Jimmy, from Stogie Press, and tonight, a very dear friend of mine from the cigar industry, Robert Holt, is our special guest, and we're going to get into what is going on with Southern Draw Cigars for the next hour or so. So let me welcome in Robert Holt. Robert, how are you? I am average. How about yourself, sir? Average? You got to be better than average. You're about, I'm a 92 you know. out of 100. <laughs> Last time I talked to you, um, you were hunkered down somewhere in the middle of Arkansas. We have stuck to that script. It's uh, going month number five now. Hiding wow. out, isolation, plenty of cigars, plenty of bourbon, and uh, neither, one of a, neither one of us have wound up sick yet. So that's good, right? Good plan. Yeah. Yeah, you've um, you, you, you went and decided to get an RV, a friend of yours, and you kind of just maneuvering around the country, kind of conducting business uh, in a mobile way. Absolutely. And staying safe and sound. You know, here's the thing, Jimmy. Um, we were going to use the RV for the most of the year anyway to go do all of our major events and all of our trade shows and those things to keep me off the airplane. Because, you know, you fly 100,000 miles a year, you're passing over customers, you're passing over retailers, you're passing over people you could fellowship with, right? So... The logic was, if we can travel together, have a mobile office, you know, Sharon and I will figure out after 24 years if we can get along or not. And uh, most importantly, you know, we can be more efficient. Is that working out? If you ask me, it's perfect. Uh, but if you ask her, eh, maybe not so much. You're meeting some, free, you're meeting some new friends along the way, I understand. You know, we gotta we gotta um, kind of limit that, right? Of course, you know, uh, staying in a little RV park, you kind of look at the neighbors left and right, and most of them are in the same situation. And uh, you know, after two or three weeks, everybody seems healthy, no coughs, no sniffles, no red eyes, you know. And ultimately, you go, okay, I can have a drink with this guy, a cigar with that gal, and uh, you know, uh, I don't think Sharon's ever met a stranger. God bless her. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's good because at that point, once you meet a few people, you only have to cook once every three days because they're going to cook every three days, too, and share it, right? So that's the cycle of uh, RV life is, uh, you know, you just try to find some people you can share uh, cigars and drinks and food with and kind of cuts down your own workload. So speaking of cigars, what are you smoking right now? Well, it was a hot day. So the Desert Rose. Sharon squirreled them away, and I found them about 10 minutes ago. So uh, I stole a couple of these out, and uh, I got my trusty draw pack here. So I got all the core blends uh, that we might work through, and then I brought the big dog in case we wanted to reevaluate uh, this stick. So I brought that just in case you and I need to smoke it later. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, you drinking anything there? What are you – is that club soda? I am drinking a – Black Tooth Amber Lager. Black Tooth from Sheridan, Wyoming. Okay, so that should give us a hint of where you might be right now. Well, that's where the beer's from. I don't know about where I'm at. Well, I am uh, I reached into the box today, and you're going you're gonna to appreciate this. So this right here. Wow. Is a pre-release. Sagus, box in the press. Toro. right? This is just yeah, it, something. I'm. This is it, man. It's gone after this. So, <laughs> well, we could find more. Um, you know that that uh, <laughs> those those white banded samples are uh, rare now. Is that the Toro you're smoking? Yes, it is. Have you smoked that cigar in the Gordo yet? No. It's, you know, I don't smoke a lot of Gordos. Everybody knows no, I'm a Lancero yeah, yeah. guy. But that blend smokes beautifully in the 6.5-60 box press Gordo. It really does. And it's, uh, 
it, it'll take you a couple hours, two hours, 15 minutes, probably regular person, you know, puffing on it. But it really burns extremely well in the Lancero and the Gordo. And of course, the Toro's the top seller, you know, for everybody. But I wouldn't shy away from the Gordo in that way. If you got two hours to burn. Right. Right. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm kind of pairing this up with uh, some red breast Irish whiskey. Red breast 12. 12. Hey, 12 is a, the optimal year, I think, for that. You know, we can go uh, more aggressive, but I think the 12 overall is probably uh, the, uh, the right one to have with a good cigar that's on that medium to full side. I might have to switch to that. I, I see a full bar over my shoulder here. Uh -huh. Nice enough to we were nice enough to be invited in to do uh, Stogie Press tonight uh, at a local establishment that allows one to enjoy cigars and drink libations, which is a rarity in, in the modern era, especially yeah, during, yep. uh, during the crisis here. But I've got a table to myself and I'm set up, and uh, they turn on the big lights for me so you can see my pale and ashy skin. But uh, <laughs> But I might, I might move away from the, the, the lager here in a bit and hit some whiskey because it is, uh, in fact, Saturday. We would. I mean, think, but, think about where we're supposed to be right now. Right now, we're supposed to be in Vegas. We're supposed to be sweating. Supposed to be sweating in the desert. Hey, you know what? It is a depressing time not to be in Vegas, not to have new releases, not to have the media and the family and the retailers and the consumers, whether it's hot or not. It's, it's depressing not to do it, but it's given us a chance, the industry to have a chance to figure out how we need to move forward cumulatively, right? We've got to adapt, we've got to overcome, that's a cliche, but the reality of it is it's true. And uh, I'm hoping that the reality for big retailers versus small, single family owned shops versus big corporates, at the end of the day, we all have to do what it takes to uh, move the needle, you know, stay in business, you know, hit our profits, we got to have the classics. We got to have the things that are new. We got to spend time with people, whether it's virtually or, or, or in person. But you know, hopefully, we all get better out of this, and we don't take it for granted, Jimmy. Because I think maybe as an industry, we started taking things for granted for a little while. That's my my observation. Well, I think we've we we we've been hit with a, a few bumps in the road over the last few years. Um, I think the industry has uh, been doing its best to navigate these these trail these, these winds that we have um this latest one uh, i see what different uh different companies are doing which i find fascinating um going on road shows having virtual perks every every couple of weeks uh going having virtual at different shops right and bringing the shops into into it offering special two-week deals directly to the shops, to the retailers. Um, so everybody's kind of doing something. Um, what, what, what is it that you're doing um, now that we don't have a show and you're out there traveling around? Well, we're trying to do two things. Uh, one, we had to be mindful that it's not just the loss of PCA as a trade show, as a major sales event for us. It's also the loss of the major annual uh, events, sales events that we've worked for for the last seven years. We've been honored to be invited to some of the biggest uh, annual events, uh, kind of the, the Hajj, the Mecca, you know, when you get to, you know, 20 and 30 annual shows, that makes a big difference in sales, right? But outside of losing the sales opportunities, it's really uh, the platform that we've always used uh, to launch our new products, right? So. Uh, if you have uh, PCA, uh, TPE, and then, of course, these major uh, annual events um, that we do have with some of the retailers, uh, we have the opportunity to invite the media. We have the opportunity to make sure our family at Southern Draw that's put their mind and their energy behind what we do. It's not just Sharon and I. Most people know that. Um, and then have the retailers and consumers that have frequented these major events. If we can't have that platform to launch a new product, it's, it's tough for us to find a, a, a motivation to try to virtually release a new line. And you'll notice that we haven't, outside of TPE, we have not released our 2020 stuff yet because we feel like we're cheating someone, you know? If every person in that list that I just gave you is, cannot participate, uh, then we feel like uh, we're leaving, a, you know, we're leaving meat on the bone. 
right? You could have this really cool virtual event where you invite your retailers, media, and everything, and you just do a, an unveiling of something very cool. Instead of a press release, do this. And, and we're probably going to have to, but what I wanted to see is I wanted to see how other brands handled it. Here's the thing. Now, Jimmy, we're stopping on each other's toes. So if Crown Heads is coming out with a new product, and Tatuahi and AJ and Roma Craft and Steve Saka, we're all fighting with the media and trying to get an audience to launch and get some, 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 some momentum behind new releases, right? And I don't know how you can do that fairly. At PCA, we're able to do it because we share the space and we celebrate each other. But I can tell you, um, being able to participate with other brands and see their launches and, and just, you know, support them. And then in turn, we find in this industry, a lot of them support us too, right? I don't know how virtually we support one another. I think that's a, that's a factor that we have to consider. Now, that being said, um, we are going to have some releases this fall, but we wanted to give everybody a chance that had already planned them, had already announced them via press to let them have the limelight because they deserve it. They worked hard. And uh, between us and the factory with AJ Fernandez, we decided just to hold off and uh, we'll do probably, uh, you know, we'll make a decision soon, but probably do a, a September and a end of October for our releases, which we will have media and everybody part of it. But uh, man, I'm struggling with the fact that not being able to sit with brothers and sisters in one place and, and really enjoy it and tell the story. Because we always have a story about what we're doing, right? And we have a charity behind what we do. And I don't, I don't know that we have found the right path, Jimmy, to accomplish what we've done in the last six or seven years and, and to do it virtually. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel natural to me. Uh, this is, it's the new norm. Um, that, you know, and, and you're right about the fact that there are so many of these going on. Yeah, it's challenging, um, but it's a, there's also a new norm coming here, I think. I think we're going to see a level of this virtual discussions and meetings happening um, even post-COVID. When people go back to some level of normality, I think we're still going to have these, these moments where we have these virtual cigar shops that we've been joining up with and sure. having conversation because it has been amazing to bring people from around the country together over a cigar visually like this, but with others all interacting together. Right, right. I, I, I don't dispute that fact. I mean, this is the new norm and I've just got to get over it, right? I got to get over it that it's not how Southern Draw does business. Think about it, Jimmy. It, it, and this is not to say anything about other brands that have come before us because they've taught us a lot. But in six years, you know, I traveled, uh, I traveled 1,648 days. So about 335, 340 days a year. And that is between the factory, but that is in shops with people doing events, right? Spending as much time as possible is what we enjoy the most. And I think it's why we were blessed with, you know, support that we have. Now, can we accomplish that virtually? I'll tell you what, Sharon and I are still working, you know, 12 hour days, six to seven days a week, uh, even on the road. Uh, it's a lot more phone calls. It's a lot more emails. You know, it's a, it's a lot more, uh, the reps aren't traveling as much. You know, we're not in shops. Those orders don't just come now. You've got to go work for them, right? Because the shops, a lot of the smaller shops are having a tough time because they didn't have business for two or three months until they figured out how to deliver or do curbside delivery or had limited hours, right? So let's answer the second part of your question, which is what have we been doing? Our reality was what can we do with the inventory that we have today um, and to support the retail shops, to make sure they have product, to make sure they get a better margin than they're used to, and to make sure that if they can make it through, we've done our part as a brand, right? So uh, from March, April, May, June, and now July, you know, our core products have been 20 to 25% off to all retailers, no matter how big or small. And every month we, we look at our inventory. Now, Jimmy, that's not back orders. That's not special orders. That's not private label. That's what do we have in stock Coming into this pandemic, we had a lot of cigars, and uh, the factory worked extremely hard to put about a half a million extra cigars in Q1. That's a lot of cigars for a little company. Uh, but there's going to come a time when we run out of that stock, right? And uh, so the discounts have, I think, helped. We've seen shops that really didn't have a lot of sales that were able to buy product at a discount and sell it. And, you know, a lot of them pass the savings on to their customers. 
to incentivize and a lot of them needed it to put, keep the lights on. So God bless them, you know. Uh, but the other side of that is we decided that the family decided that if we want to be smart about this until we see the, the, the end of this, or at least we have an idea, right? Um, let's not spend so much time on new releases. Let's, let's not push the retailers to force them to feel compelled to support another brand from Southern Draw, a new release, right? Thank you. Um, let's, let's focus on our core brands, our core blends, and our core sizes that make them the most money. Yes, it's exciting to do new cigars and, and line extensions and, and new charitable things, right? But, Jimmy, the way they're going to make their money right now is to focus on our core blends and our core sizes. So we've really not talked about anything since, you know, January or February about new. That doesn't mean we don't have it, and that doesn't mean it's not coming. But what if you and I did a show today and we announced a new product and a new launch? Our retailers are going to feel compelled to participate and support it. And maybe they don't have the money to do it. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's a fair ask for us to do that right now. And that's why we're really holding on the reins a little yeah. bit here, despite our willingness and our desire to get them in your hands. And we're not going to win any awards in 2020. We know it. We're not going to be Cigar Company of the Year. We're not going to be Brand of the Year. We're not going to have – we're not because we're not going to put that many new cigars out there uh, in time for the media to support it. That doesn't mean you're not going to get cigars from us. You're going to try new things. What I'm saying is I'm not going to put the, bonus, the, the burden we're not going to put the burden on our retailers to feel like they have to come up with more cash to support something new from us. Let's keep them what we have and let's give them a good deal. And, and, and in the end, we're all going to hurt, but let's hurt together. You had this half a million or so cigars that showed up in the first quarter. You're running through that inventory. What's it like right now in Esteli? What's it like down at AJ's factory? Are you, products able to get out of that country right now because they they're starting to spike up down there. no it's tough uh we have not had a shipment in four months uh delivered uh, we expect next month that we will now i'll tell you this according to uh freddie and aj last week uh, the the demand is still there uh, they're working smartly you know obviously it's tough in a factory to have proper distancing but they're taking precautions but they're so busy trying to catch up from those March, April, May that they're working multiple shifts right now. And I'm sure other factories that are now back on the line are faced with the same dilemma, which is we're going to have to work longer hours and more shifts. Right. Um, and so, you know, for us, yeah, we're going to see about a 50% reduction in this quarter's production forecast because a, we don't know if we're going to have it, have the product that we need to deliver because of the trade show. Number one, uh, and B, um, we, uh, we, we, we need to make sure that we, again, focus on core blends, core sizes, Robusto, Toro, Gordo, make sure that our core stuff is sound. Uh, so, you know, we're really focused on that. The factory's honored that, and they're going to make those as the priority. And then, of course, we'll have some fun, you know, once we figure out how to have fun. But, uh, but it might take some offline discussions with people like yourselves and with Coop and with Dojo and, and and, and, you know, some of the media that's helped us over the years, because usually you kind of get kind of a limited exclusive with us. We try to split that up between the media members to get first looks and things. And uh, we want to be fair about that, too. But we've also got to figure out a way to make sure the retailers don't don't think that we're telling them that they got to buy 100 boxes of what's coming new. And I don't think that's fair. With a um, with, with a pretty large footprint now across the United States, and you've done a really great job over the last six years from, building that. Um, have you been notified of or aware of any shops that have essentially shut the doors, turned lights off, out of business? Or are they weathering this storm right now? Uh, I can say that um, just off the top of my head, I'm not aware of anyone that has notified us that they're no longer in business. Uh, and if I did, I, I, I'll tell you what, I, you would have seen uh, a release from me probably coming out saying, we've got to find a way to band together. I don't mean if it means every brand in their humidor needs to put some product in their hands and give them as much time as they need to sell that product and pay their bills. Uh, so, but I've seen a lot of people in pain now, you know, financially. But I will tell you that I have heard a lot of feedback from retailers that said, now that we're doing curbside delivery and phone in orders, uh, that our numbers are up 100%. I've heard some really unique uh, 
growth strategy that they didn't know that existed before. And I've heard that feedback in the last few weeks that really perked my ears up. And I said, well, God bless you. You know, here, I'm worried about you. And I find out that you're up 106%, you know, uh, that's good because they found a way uh, to survive and succeed. Right. And uh, I, I hope more and more people are able to do that. Yeah. But, but we're not the only brand to give it, you know, everybody's given incentives. Everybody's helping where they can. Right. And I think that's, what's important. If every brand in their humidor that they've supported is going to give them terms or give them discounts, something to help them get along. I think we'll see less people shutting the doors and more people just kind of fighting through it. You know? And when you think about it, if you're doing curbside or some people doing delivery, like you said, doing phone, um, you still got the physical presence of the shop, but maybe you're not, not utilizing the inside of the shop as much. Um, right. There's a, the, the, there's a slight savings in one side of that that translates and makes that 100% growth look even better. New shops, so that's really good right. news. Really good to hear that that's going on. Um, you're the first one that's brought that up, so that's uh, that's really good. Um, you know, I, I think mainly because um, you got January, February, March, most people physical year that that's Q1, and then you have you know April, May, June, Q2. So now we just got July, and people are starting to look at that Q2, they're reconciling their financials. And you know, I've had several conference calls in the last week that were very uplifting in a sense that uh, it's not as bad. Yes, in the retail side, we're not doing as well. But on the other distribution channels that these retailers have now adopted, we're climbing and climbing, not just us, them overall. And I hope that continues for all the brands uh, that, uh, you know, let's not critique each other's shops and how they do business at the end. We've got to do what it takes to survive. Yes, we want to keep the playing field fair. We want to keep you know, honor pricing and all that. But if I came out and said, okay, nobody discounts more than 10%, plus or minus 10%, it's not the right thing to do right now. Do what you have to do. We're not looking the other way, but you're not hurting anybody else by taking care of your own family. You're not hurting anybody else and you're not hurting our brand. And if it puts me out of business because we're not making them honor B&M agreements, uh, then so be it. But we're going to continue to offer discounts as long as we have product, as long as they need the product, and we expect nothing in return. We just want to feel like we did everything we could with what we had. And I think uh, uh, I'm seeing that from a lot of brands. I really am. Now, we've got a couple of interesting things going on in the industry besides all of this COVID crap that's around us. Uh, we've, we've most recently won a pretty good court battle with regards to warning labels on boxes. And I'd like to get your opinion on that. But also, um, after that, Let's talk a little bit about what's what's coming up on September 9th. September 9th, predicate date. I want to get your thoughts on that also. So the first thing is, what's your what's your thoughts on the whole warning label uh, uh, court case that we just kind of won? Well, you know, any victory is uh, against the FDA is substantial. Uh, it was hard fought. And if you're in the industry as a consumer or a media member or a retailer, a manufacturer, brand owner, whatever, and you've never appreciated your associations and you've never appreciated where your dues went and you think that they're all living high on the hog and eating fancy dinners and drinking fancy whiskey and smoking fancy cigars and are not doing anything, now's the time to apologize. Now's the time to say, you know what, they were doing something. And just because I personally wasn't didn't have visibility, which maybe I should, but I didn't have it. That doesn't mean they weren't working. And that doesn't mean this result didn't come from PCA and CRA. And the list goes on of major brands that supported that, that are healed enough. And you, it, we all need to pause for a moment and say, thank you, because I'll tell you what, anybody that's traveled the world, uh, you know, I remember going to uh, the factory in Nicaragua in 2014. And I remember a gentleman coming there and working on a new brand for Australia. And again, it's uh, warning labels, plain packaging. And uh, these are challenges that cannot really be overcome. Could you imagine three or four years ago, we all went through this warning label registration and we had to plan it for our boxes, 30% and all that. But that is more than just a headache. That is taking away the identity of a brand uh, in, our, in our right to free speech. And that's the argument, right? So I think for the courts to stand up and say that is our right to free speech. It's not about education on this premium product that we call a hand-rolled cigar, right? That victory is important, and we all need to say thank you. 
it, and more to the point, it would have changed our industry where I think a lot of brands would have just thrown their hands in the air and goes, we're never going to win anything. If we can't win the, the, the warning label battle in court, we're certainly not winning SE or grandfather or anything else or new S chip or new FDA uh, fees, right? Uh, it's an important victory, and I think we all need to take a lap around the track, wave the flag, and go thanks to everybody that, that made it happen. Because not everybody participated and carried their own weight. There's people that have not honored anything from the FDA brands that have not even paid attention, that have invested in their brands, but have really done not invested the time and money uh, to, uh, to be in compliance. And we know that, right? But the more people that are not in compliance, Jimmy, is the more that risks us all because we're all lumped together in that sits. But so I think it's an important victory. We'll put that aside. September, so September 9th, we got mean, sorry, substantial, sorry. right substantial equivalence but yeah. stuff. Um, doesn't look way, like that's I'm moving. Um, there's rumor well, that it could be shifted, but if that holds solid, what does that do to a bar company like Southern Drawer? And what do you think happens overall in the industry based on what you just said, some that haven't paid attention to it? Um, you know, a couple of things about substantial equivalence. You know, if you win one suit, you know, you're kind of hedging your bets a little bit. I think there's a little momentum here. Uh, if you sit down at the roulette table and there's 13 black, what are the odds that the next one's going to be black, red, or green, right? They're the same odds as they were on the last 13 spins. That's the reality of it, right? So our odds of success in this battle are the same as they were before we won this little bat this little this little uh, warning label issue. But does it give people the motivation and allocate the financial resources and professional service resources to fight it harder? And I think that's the answer. I think you're going to see more going into it because there is a little bit of momentum. Now, what will substantial equivalence here, here again, I think we all have to agree. We don't know because we don't know what it's going to cost. We don't know what the process is going to be. We just have to be prepared. And I've said this in the, since 2016. Um, we're doing everything we can to be in compliance. We've followed everything to this point. Now, we have a lot of brands now. We have a lot of line extensions. We have a lot of SKUs, right? If we have to follow substantial equivalence, and it's even financially viable, Jimmy, um, I think we've got to go back and look and go, what are we as a brand? And we're a brand that we really need to focus on a few products, a few core things and really do things well. And it may not hurt us in that sense, right? Because we've, we've only scratched the surface in our opinion of where our retail partners, our distributors and everybody are. We can make a living with what we have. Now, the sad part of that is, you know, spending 2014, 15, 16, on over 893 SKUs that Southern Draw has, brands that we produced, that we brought into the country, that we paid S chip on and we prepared, right? It's a tremendous amount of future that we bet on. So this could erase all of that, right? It could erase all of that work. And it could erase some of the things we already have on the market that we just don't sell enough of that would justify spending the money and going through the process. Now, since we don't know what it's going to cost and how long it's going to take, because the FDA hasn't defined that process, um, my question really internally with our family is, what do we do come September if the date doesn't budge? What do we do? Because I don't know that any of us are going to really know what, we, what, what we're supposed to be doing. I think there needs to be some clarity there. But but I also think you got the paperwork yeah. filed? Uh, of course. We've done everything. We followed, have you we heard everything. Have you heard back? You know, I bring this up. I brought this up with somebody else today in a private conversation. The other day, I came across a little news article um, on the cigarette side of the world where the FDA has put out some orders about substantial equivalence in cigarettes, okay? And there's a number of lines they have ordered off the shelf. They're not predicate. They're not substantial equivalent. They denied it. And the denial is off the shelf. And if you go on the FDA site, you can see all of the orders and all of the things that they've done. And you know what I don't see? I don't see anything about cigars on there. So have you gotten any notification after some of A receipt notification, but nothing more. Nothing no, more at no all. No approval um, or denial. None. None whatsoever. So, so they got a lot of work in front of them between now and September to get 
all of these brands and lines and 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 my toll is approved or denied and i don't know how and they, they can't do and, and they can't do it and, and and that's the sad part unless they do it as a blanket everything is denied or everything is approved right but here's the thing yeah i know they refuse to extend it despite covid pandemic and all that but the reality of it is even the judge said it again it's 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 unfair and you should you should extend that deadline and it hasn't happened yet here we are two months out you know but uh we have to hope that it will but what would extending it do for us to extend it for three months or six months right nothing because we still have no clarity on the process the time and the money involved right how do we make an educated guess until they give us what we need which they're required to give us how do you how do you enforce something when there's not even a written rule right it's it's tough i mean there's there's no no parking sign but i just got my car towed because that's what they're trying to do right they want to tow our car but they never want to give us a warning that we shouldn't have parked there to begin with right it's it's a it's a tough situation for most of us yeah and it makes us it, it makes us yeah it makes us reassess how we're going to do business moving forward because when you're on this small brand you know uh, it's the onus is on you you know in my our case we've got a lot of family involved in this and i mean it's it's our it's our lifeblood right and uh you know they've invested time and money in it and it's our responsibility but yet the fda's got this cloud over us because they're not telling us how to prepare we don't know would all of your brands fall under substantial equivalence or would some of them actually fall under grandfather um i i don't think we would have any under grandfather a absolutely yeah. not uh, but they all, all of them would fall under SE for sure. Because, you know, I told this story not long ago, but you know, when we were doing our APHES compliance before we started shipping to the military bases, all that deeming regulation documentation back in 2014. So basically before that August, 2016 date, we had, I just, Sharon and I just reviewed it two days ago. I think it's like 800 or 93 or 993 SKUs of all of our blends all of our package types, all of our Vitolas, uh, and it's a tremendous amount of things, and of which probably we have 20% of it on the market right now. We have, a, we have a lot of things that we paid a lot of money to produce, to import, to sell to some certain retailers, and then to you know, kind of keep the, keep the marketing uh, shroud over it, you know, so we'd have it for the future, but we did everything, and if you remember, we didn't go to the trade show in 2016 because we were finishing all that in hopes that we had enough toys to play with in the future if and when this time came. And it looks like it's here now. Right. So we. So the the, the sad part is if, if they want to deny it, based on the the cigarette orders I saw, they literally order them off the shelf immediately. I mean, the right. retailer has to then contact, and there's got to, and they and they say it's between you and the manufacturer, and mm -hmm. cannot sell these anymore in the United States as of the date right. of the, which is frightening. So inventory sitting both in your warehouses and inventory in shops around the country, and it's just it's a cow. <laughs> It's, 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 it's unfathomable if that's a, a good word for a Saturday, but you know, it won't be one of those. I don't think come September overnight, they go, okay, you're not, we have to be given the opportunity to go through the substantial equivalence process. They're not going to order everything off the shelf and tell you pass it. You've got to be in the process, right? And that process is something they haven't defined yet. So we have done everything up to this point and more uh, than they've ever required, right? And we hope that we've done it and we've taken the guidance and direction of people for, you know, far well, better healed and better represented legally than we are. Um, but uh, we think we, we are a firm believer that everything we've done would fall within SE once we understand that process and the cost. And if we need to cut some of those things, great. But, uh, you know, there's some other strategy discussions going on that are outside of what we can discuss publicly, right, with how we would survive and succeed in a world that you know southern draw wouldn't be on their own there's there's other other things we could do right but i don't think it's you know the time and place yet to disclose how we might address that but we all i think we all 
the people I've talked to in this industry all have a very similar strategy in a sense. Right now, we just want to see what the responsibility and the time and the cost would be, and we'll make better decisions at that point. Now, one of the other debates I, I, I get into with some brand owners is the topic of predicate. And there are some people that are under the belief that predicate, which means that if the tobacco has been used in other brands, it is predicate, and you can claim that as an exemption. I, I hear I hear that argument myself, and in that case, nobody really has some special unknown tobacco unless they just hybridized it themselves in the last few <laughs> years, right? But you know that would that would certainly make a lot more sense. It's still you know natural air cured long long fill tobacco, right? I mean, it's that that's really what it is. There's only so many varieties out there, and they've all been used in by larger brands. Because if it wasn't for the large brands and the big classic brands, none of us would be here. Right. None of us would be here, right? So we all we did was follow their lead and put our own interpretation. So is that predicate by definition? Absolutely. Interesting. But in the end, we don't make, we don't, yeah, we don't make the rules. But in the end, if you want to interpret it, we have not reinvented the wheel here. It's not a new wheel. It's just a wheel. We used all the same parts, right? We just put it together a different way, right? It's uh, it, ratio should not matter. The ingredients in the cake are still the same ingredients that your mom and your grandmother used to make the cake. And yet your wife makes a cake that tastes different than your mom and grandmother with the same ingredients. And this is a cake. We make, we all make cake and they all taste different, but we use the same exact ingredients. Right. Right. Yeah. So that, 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 that that's a good way of looking at it. I, I guess we'll wait and see how the FDA responds to it because I'm sure there are some uh, powerful cigar industry leaders that will work that for multiple of their clients. That sure. if that's the angle, then then they push that angle, and we'll see how it goes. Steve Saka joined us, so he must be know. finishing his day of fishing or something. <laughs> You know, I know he went fishing. I feel it in my bones. Yeah, he was he, he was kind of commenting about, um, I guess, you know, Half Wheel did an interpretation of the decision on the warning labels, and he doesn't believe that that's a proper interpretation of the decision. Um, so I, I don't need to get too deep into that. Um, some people, I know some people feel that the decision wasn't anything big for the industry, only because it already kind of was pulled back. It was just a little added piece. Um, but like you said earlier, a win is a win. And it's, I think it's the worst. Anytime, anytime a court sides with your argument, you're the victim. We just went against the FDA. I don't give a shit if it was about the, the mention of a cigar ban. We won something. We yeah. set a precedent by winning something, and everybody's interpretation is their own. But uh, let's not over let's not over complicate things, right? A win's a win's a win. A one run win, a thirteen win, it's a win. And I just look at it as the courts looked at it and said our argument was better than theirs. And we came out on top. Can we do it again and again and again and again? And I hope that's the case. And it was we unanimous win. This? It was unanimous and, decision. And think about it. Think about it, Jimmy. Everybody's head was down. The pandemic's here. We got all these deadlines and all these things. We're all sad and depressed. Are we going to take our toys and go home? No. If everybody's not re-motivated and re-engaged uh, at this point, then they don't need to be in the industry anyway. Because that has got to give you a little motivation to say, together, we can do it. But if we don't make the effort and we don't support that effort, then we don't deserve it anyway. So I guess I just want to look at it a little harsher to say, this industry is welcome to a lot of people, but you also need to be pull your part of the weight, right? You really do, because everybody deserves that. Are you ready for baseball next week? I guess I've been gone so long, I didn't know the 60 games season started. 
I, I think my Rangers have a chance. If they only have to pay 60 games, they'll probably win 50 of those. If they paid 180, they would win 50 of those, you know. <laughs> so well, it, gives, I mean, it gives the people in Texas a chance. It's well, the problem that, is you know. it's the way it, – it's how this season is going to roll out, right? It's 60 games, 40 are in your league, right? So, like, the Red Sox play all of their – American League East division only right. for 40 games. And then they play 20 interleague games, but only in that division. So they have to play 20 games against the National League East. You guys are in the – are you in the West or the Central? Uh, AO West. You're in the West, which is kind of weird because you'd have to travel to California. Right. Well, you get Houston and Texas in the division. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's, and it's weird. always been that way. If you think about it, you got you got Houston and Texas playing, you know, playing, uh, you know, Oakland and uh, it, it's in L.A. You know, it's just crazy. Same division, and Seattle. It's kind of weird. Kind of crazy. And it, it, it's it, and it's going to be interesting how it plays out. Obviously, we've got some players that have opted out, not even to play. All right, for the sake of the owner, their, their health and their desire for their, their health, others that can't opt out. Um, I, it's going to be fun to watch, man. I, I'm, I'm jonesing for it personally. I can't wait till I think it's Saturday is the opening day for the Red Sox. They play the Orioles. So, you know, 60 games, I'll watch all 60 games and we'll see what it is. And then the playoffs, who knows how that all works. But then they have to move all around, you know. Later in the year. Well, I mean, I'm not I'm not a soccer guy, you know, but when the soccer announced their playoffs after the layoff, Dallas, the Dallas team, which is a pretty powerful team, my understanding in Major League Soccer, had so much coronavirus within the team and the family that they removed them from the playoffs. They took them out of the playoffs. They didn't even let them go. No, you guys are too risky. You can't come. They were not allowed to participate. Now, take us into baseball this fall. All this is going on. Are the hot zones like Texas or New York now not going to be allowed to play? Because Florida. That's the precedent. That's been New York's not Florida. so bad. It's Florida. Florida is it? Yeah. But, but We're it in bad seems, shape. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and I think they should suspend all records. Nobody should be able to bat 400, put it on the books over 60 games. That's BS. I mean, right. come on. That's, um, but that they won't, because I guarantee you, somebody, maybe one or two players, somebody for the Rockies organization at that altitude playing all those games, they're going to bat 400. It's going to happen, and we're going to see them on the list with everybody else. You know, they're 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 never going to be Ted. You know, they're never going to be him. <laughs> there you go. Not your cousin, your, your, your cousin Brock, now with the Brewers, will be the one to do that. And, and the Brewers have a couple of guys that can do it, you know. But uh, it's going to happen. You know, we're going to have some we're going to have some dilemmas, I think, to deal with, with a, a short season over. But you know, is college football's following behind it? In the end, are all the conference teams, are all the conferences, going to make a decision? They're only going to play conference games, which means that shakes up the whole playoff system because if you only play conference games, and, you know. For me, I like it because a lot of those teams that go every year to the playoffs play cupcake teams. They play nobody. They beat them up. They pay millions of dollars to go beat them up, pump their stats, get Heisman's, but ultimately they don't take the toll, right? They don't get beat up like other teams, right? Um, so I guess we'll see. You know, we'll, we'll see how the sports season. It's tough to get excited when I can't even go into a cigar shop and sit down and smoke cigars with people and watch a game. You know, I'm, I've been working on this package design uh something I had to do something special for a project and I didn't hear from the guy for a couple of weeks I got a little short with him and he had he has, he has corona and he's been really ill and he's been trying to get treatment and he hasn't been on his phone and his computer and you know I got thinking about it Robert how do you consider it you're pushing the guy and finally he felt well enough just to let me know that he was sick <laughs> mm -hmm. so until you put yourself in that position and it, and it affects you immediately or your family immediately um, I don't think you realize that it's not something to mess with for us, good news is we smoke a lot of cigars, we drink a lot of bourbon, and it's going to keep us healthy. Because I don't That's, care what the FDA says, this works. It seems this, this government has not spent a penny on Robert Holt since I left the military. They've not taken care of me in any capacity, not one penny. 
And it's all because my wife takes care of me from a health standpoint. I smoke a lot of cigars. That's a fact. They can't argue it. Now, I can't go publish that, right? But it's a fact. It's a fact that I'm the healthiest unhealthy person I know. But it's the cigars, <laughs> baby. It's, it's what it is. Enjoy the club. And vitamin C. Uh, thanks for asking. You know, the SEAL Foundation is a big organization. And like I mentioned when we launched it, you know, being a top 1% of charities in the U.S. is a, a pretty substantial thing, knowing that every penny that's contributed uh, uh, goes to the, you know, goes to the mission, right? No, no overhead, SG&A, those kind of things. Now, uh, I can say I, I expected Ignite last year with the SEAL Foundation, Navy SEAL Foundation, to be better received. Uh, I expected it to have a lot more traction and be able to donate more money. And I'll, and I'll tell you, as the year went along, uh, it's probably my fault that we had so many new releases, right? So many line extensions, new releases that we might have overshadowed it a little bit. So what we did is we decided to recommit for 2020. And, uh, you know, what we're finding is it's a great product to hand sell at events, uh, but for retailers just to order on their regular order, most of them didn't. The veteran-owned shops, of course, did. Uh, but uh, it's just now gaining that traction. But the good news is, you know, um, when we got to uh, July, uh, you know, we celebrated Independence Day, and we basically said, okay, we're going to make all Ignite Series 25% off. We're still going to pay the full donation. And that allows the retailers to really make a huge margin on a great product because those are uniquely, you know, uh, those are uniquely uh, uh, different blends, you know, and sizes, right? They're, they're truly something unique and fresh. And one of the major media outlets, they named one of the Ignite series, uh, that's one of the best new cigars of the year thus far, right? Which is kind of a big thing when there's so many cigars out there, right? But they're not lesser quality, but for us, it's mission first. So, we hope, and I'm proud you asked the question, we hope that more and more of our retail partners, consumers understand those are as good as anything else we do. Uh, and there's a great mission behind it. And ultimately, every time a, you know, a retailer or a consumer buys it, they're contributing money. They're directly contributing money because we're contributing it based on the number of cigars we produce, not on the number that they buy, right? So, uh, but good line, you know, you got five good solid blends of cigars that are in that project and we're going to carry it all the way through the end of 2020 before we move on to a, a, the next charity. And I can tell you, I, I, I broke out a, uh, a, a Navy SEAL Habano the other day and that's been aging in the humidor for a while since I, since I got them. And that has, that has aged very nicely. I have, I have to tell you that right now. I'm getting ready to put the review out on that one because it burned beautifully. It had, the, the, I think it's a better cigar now than it was when I first broke it out of the bundle. Oh, nice, nice. Well, if you need more, let me know. Have you been smoking the Corojo? I, yep, yep. I, I really like that. I like the barber pole. Actually, I like all five blends. The Connecticut is uniquely different. It's great. You know, I wish I had made it in, one, in two Vitolas, you know, not just the double Corona. Uh, but uh, uh, the San Andreas really stands. I mean, all five of those blends are really good. They're unique sizes, but they're probably not sizes that everybody would reach for, you know, double Corona. But uh, the Rothschild ones, the 550s are really tasty and uh you know every time we get a few samples here on the road uh i make sure we have a few of those but uh that habano is in the truest sense of the word a habano of habanos it is a true classic it really captures the essence of what this these tobaccos are in this in this you know it's an ecuadorian habano and all nicaraguan filler but it's a uh, it's a great blend and uh it'll it, you know if we expand this project we're going to actually add some great vitolas because i think Lanzero, Lancero, Lonsdale, those kind of things that are that are on tap. Uh, Jimmy, that blend's going to burn well in those smaller ring gauges. Really going to do well. Yeah, Stephen uh, Keen says he loves the Connecticut. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And almost everybody you named, I get to interact with them, and I appreciate them watching, participating. I appreciate all their comments on our social media. You know, I'm not that great at it anymore, especially as much as we're driving and what we're doing, but you know, on an average day, I, I get to like or comment on about 3,000 posts, which I think is a pretty tremendous number. And maybe it's because everybody's bored and sitting at home, right? But uh, it, it really is the highlight of our day, every day, to see that people are still engaged on social media and 
despite not having all these new releases and fun things for the trade show, they're still tracking, you know, and they're supporting and they're commenting and taking photos, which I love, you know, everybody loves photos, but you know, it, it takes a lot of time for people to take a picture and to make comments and to go find tags and hashtags and actually use them so that, you know, um, it, yeah. I think it's pretty, it's pretty dynamic that people will spend their limited free time copying the brands that they support and making sure we get feedback because it's it's invaluable to me you know i mean there's times when we have a bad day you know times are tough you pop up and you get to see a couple of posts you know like mina cigar lounge southern draw sunday out in maryland uh the, the smoke hounds these guys when they post these photos i mean 10 20 30 at a time on a sunday Man, it's, it's pretty uplifting, you know? Like, we're not forgotten, even though we're not in the lounge with you, right? I'm not there with you, but I'm there with you. What I normally do now is I move into what's kind of new, news and reviews on Stogie Press and uh, what's happening in the industry. All right, so uh, this week, so a couple of big things on Stogie Press. Uh, the first thing we did, my, my wife has done some amazing new updates to Stogie Press for, from a visual perspective. Two things we've done, we've added, we've always had this button here, which gives you the latest posts. And that's everything that's been posted out over the week. Um, and she recently added this now, recent cigar reviews. So down here, whatever cigars we just recently came out with for the reviews, they show up down here. There'll be the last four, and this is always a sliding thing. So as a new one comes in, the right one slides over. Um, the, the format of this has changed now. We've updated the format on how the reviews look. So I'll just open this up for a second. Um, so what now you'll see is when you open the review, you'll see obviously the cigar and the title and all such right at the top. And then we've added this area here, which is kind of a synopsis of the cigar along with a summary. It gives you the country of origin, the factory, the Vitola, the MSRP, uh, the basic flavor profile that I picked up and the strength, and then the construction of the wrapper, binder, and filler. So we've added all of that up at the very top. So very quickly, you can go into Stogie Press and be able to see um, a synopsis of that cigar, the rating, and the, and the summary. Um, and then after that, we'll follow the normal uh, layout that we've always had, which breaks it down for the pre-light and the cigar review notes and, and so forth as we go through. So that's the latest update from a, uh, for what we've done on Stogie Press to make this a little easy to use. These only will appear on the new cigar reviews because there's so many on the site. I can't go back and adjust everything for that because I got to take, I don't have all the photos to do this correctly to get the, uh, to get the first image in here. Um, so all new cigar reviews will come out this way going forward. Um, as far as uh, what's new in the news and stuff, we can go over to back to the home. We announced uh, last week the uh, Al Bradley came out with their 10 year anniversary fine and rest set going on sale to tobacconists. Uh, we published the, uh, the uh, uh, episode 17, which is the consumer panel is out there now. I will have the Blanco, uh, 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 the, the, the Blanco's uh, news uh out later tomorrow probably i just it was a bigger show i just have to trim it down and, and get it right so that'll be published um we announced also that uh steve soccer the back when trust announces they're doing what's called a timeshare experience uh kind of a little snicker snicker from uh from our friend steve soccer uh where he's basically going through and offering a an approach on how he's going to uh address this this issue how they're going to deal and serve their retail customers um in in the uh in, in this pandemic that we're dealing with all right um he's looking out there for anybody who uh wants to get involved if they already sent emails out to the uh their 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 current purveyors if they haven't received that they can always ask and just uh send, send a message out here and to get on board with this um the we reviewed the, uh, uh, the, the new Drew Estate, leather, the Deadwood Leather Rose. So this is an infused cigar. I don't do a lot of infused cigars, but 
but I, I was rather pleased with this cigar. This is one of those cigars that, um, although it's infused, it really had a, a, a really decent burn on it, um, had a nice burn cone. The flavors were there. It had a profile where the very beginning of this would be what I would consider very much the infused part. But somewhere around the midway, you started getting all that good premium tobacco that's in that blend starts to shine and show through. So uh, very nice cigar, about an hour and 20, 20 minutes smoke. Um, check it out. If you are an infused cigar lover, if you're an acid lover or anything like that, or a deadwood uh, lover of cigars, these, these cigars got to be in your wheelhouse for sure. Um, we go into... Uh, uh, Espinosa announced their uh, the latest uh, Warhead Six. This is the sixth rendition of the Warhead that they they're coming out with. Um, again, this is a broadleaf wrapper with Nicaraguan binders and fillers. It's got an MSRP of ten dollars. These are hitting the shelves now. It's a five by fifty eight Figurado. Um, the interestingly, there you know, in the midst of everything we got going on, in the midst of even this pandemic hitting state of Florida pretty hard. Uh, South Miami is uh, celebrating a new cigar lounge called the Empire Cigar Lounge. And the Empire Cigar Lounge is uh, the, the work of the folks that brought to you um, the, the, the Monte Cristo Cigar Lounge and Prime Cigar Lounges. So this is now this new sophisticated relaxation. This is an absolutely gorgeous place in the photos. One of these days I will get down there and do a proper review of it. But you can just tell from the photos, this is a really nice, relaxing lounge to hang out in. Um, nice big humidor cabinets. Um, so if you're in the Miami area, South Miami, uh, definitely uh, get a chance to check it out. Um, I, I don't know if they're open uh, or they've been able, or they just recently have to shut down because the mayor has been clamping down on things in, in Miami. But it's there. So if anybody goes, check it out. You know, give me some feedback. Um, Crown Heads uh, has extended their Juarez line. They've added what they call the Chihuahua. So the Chihuahua is not named after the dog. It's named after the province in, in Mexico, Chihuahua province. Um, and this is going to be a five and a half by 48 Pereo. Um, they're calling this the Chihuahua. And it's... Uh, basically the same blend as the original um, uh, Juarez cigar. So that's hitting the shelves now next. And we reviewed the Jacob's Ladder Brimstone. I'm gonna take you off mute now. So we reviewed the, uh, take yourself off mute, there you go. So, so, so we reviewed the Jacob's Ladder Brimstone. Now I'll admit, um, you know, I, I've smoked a dozen of these cigars, and to be honest, they 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 pretty much uh, they they've they they've a little mellowed at, over the year. Um, so the first one I, I lit up, but from a construction perspective, it basically followed the the, the, the same the, the same criteria that they all they all kind of in the same way. It's a beautifully constructed cigar, beautiful facto. All right, um, I mean, it just starts off with a nice burn. That burn lock looking good. It's got a decent little little burn. Um, the only thing here really that we dealt with was that there was a mild wave and a burn. It did have a kind of a flat burn cone. I like to burn cone. And this is the thing that really hit us the most, is that the smoke does get a little hot in the final third. And that's the one thing that probably took the thing off. Other than that, this has been consistent across all the samples we've had. And you know this is definitely a fabulous cigar. If you're a if you're a Jacob's Ladder fan and you haven't had the Brimstone, you need to check. It. And then um, that is pretty much the news of the week. Um, no major news coming out of the FDA this week. Last week was the, the around the, uh, the the warning labels. 
So we are, uh, so I want to thank everybody that stayed on. Um, sorry about the glitches. Technology is with technology these days. Um, thank everybody for joining. Robert, it's always a pleasure. Looking forward to you coming back into Florida and have a little Diavita food. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Tell, tell, tell the wife hello for Sharon and I as well. Thank everybody for uh, joining us this evening on a Saturday. They could be doing a lot of things, but they watched you and I smoke cigars. Oh, well, but it's always an honor. And uh, like I said, it won't be long. We'll have something fresh and new to talk about. And uh, just gotta, we gotta, we gotta find a way to make sure everybody's included. So if you could help me figure out how to do that, Jimmy, we'll do it together. There we go. All right, everybody. Thank you. And, uh, Again, next week, no show. There will be a raffle, though, on Saturday as planned. And um, we'll catch you on the rebound.